All right, so as you can see on the agenda, <clears throat> the Hooke's Law worksheet and positive physics, just the work section and just the Hooke's Law part only, uh, that's what's due tonight. So you should basically be doing six problems, four of them from the worksheet. And then when you go to positive physics unit 17, make sure you're in the work section. The assessment section is locked. So you need to go to the work section. And then there's a whole bunch of skills. If you look at the skill column, it's like inquiry, review, Hooke's Law, vocab, all these different things. You only do the Hooke's Law. So all the other stuff we'll get to later, but just for now, just the Hooke's Law and only the two questions that are in the work section. So then when you're done, if you're doing your worksheet on like Word or something like that, you can just take a snapshot of your screen when you're done with positive physics, showing your name and your percentages. And the completion percent is what I'm going to be grading you on. So as long as you do corrections, you should get 100%. And then you'll just submit that as a single document on Axis. Should be submitted by tonight before midnight Pacific time. And um, <clears throat> the positive physics, if you're... If you aren't doing it that way, if you're printing it out and handwriting it, then whatever you use to scan it, if you're using Cam Scanner or Genius Scan or whatever, probably an, a phone app is the easiest. Scan your pay, pages. Well, it's just one page. You don't have to scan the back because I don't need to see the answers. Uh, so just scan the page and then scan your computer screen so I can see um, your scores and your name in the image. And that should be good. So questions on that Hooks Law assignment before we jump into today's agenda. <clears throat> All right. Uh, if you have specific questions about certain problems or something like that, you will have about half the period today just to work. And so uh, maybe even a little bit more. So uh, when we get to that work part, if you want to ask some individual questions, I'll stop the recording and you're welcome to ask questions at that point, just one on one. Um, and then I would like to go over the elevator ride activities. They've been submitted and graded, and you can see your scores on Axis. As we go through these, um, I would encourage you to follow along, maybe make some corrections, ask questions, make sure you really understand it well. The whole idea of elevator problems, is, the reason I'm spending so much time, we did two different activities and spent quite a bit of time on this. There's almost always multiple questions on the AP exam revolving around how elevators work and how the forces on an elevator um, behave. And so it, it's uh, not just something to give you review on forces. It's actually because I know it's very frequently a pretty heavy topic on the exam. It doesn't typically show up very often in the free response question, although I have seen it there before. It's usually multiple, multiple choice questions. So maybe like three that go together kind of a thing. Um, and so you really do need to understand it well. And as simple as it seems when you first hear it, it's actually often one that confuses students quite a bit. So I wanted to spend a fair bit of time on it, and including some time today to go over the answers. So hopefully you've had a chance to find your pages, whether you're opening them up on Axis or your own print copies or digital copies. Um, and we're going to go over them together to make sure that you understand every part of it. <clears throat> And I'll also explain how I graded it. So we're going to start with the feelings in the elevator, which was your first lab grade for the semester. Um, not a lab report, so no corrections or anything for it, but just a lab grade because it had a hands-on component to it. So these first several questions, I basically was just grading as if it was completion. Uh, you know, it's predictions, it's, it's memory. Um, it's trying to formulate what you think might happen before you've actually done the hands-on activity. So we'll just discuss it quickly, but uh, does, the does everyone on the elevator feel heavier or lighter at the same times? And they should, because what makes you feel heavier or lighter is the acceleration. When the elevator accelerates up or down, you feel heavier or lighter corresponding to that. And so you would all feel it at the same time. You wouldn't necessarily all have the same normal force because we would have different weights, but uh, you would all feel the changes at the same times. And then describe the times when you would feel normal anytime the elevator's at rest and anytime that the elevator is moving at a constant velocity, you would just feel normal. And if you were standing on a bathroom scale, like we see in the other assignment, uh, then it would read your normal weight. Describe the times when you expect to feel heavier than your normal weight. Um, and you aren't actually gaining weight, obviously. Your weight stays constant the whole time. 
it's just the normal force. So when you feel heavier, what, it's, what it means is the floor is pushing against you more. The normal force is greater. Um, your weight didn't actually change. So anytime that the, acceler uh, the elevator is accelerating you upward, that is going to make you feel heavier, even though it's really just an increased normal force. So that would happen as you go from rest to moving upward, when it starts to accelerate you upward. According to Newton's first law, we know that you won't accelerate upward unless a force is applied to you. So the normal force has to be more than your weight to accelerate you upward. Uh, the other time you would feel that is when you're descending and coming to a stop. Because again, Newton's first law, you should stay in motion until a force acts on you. So you should stay in motion. The floor has to push against you to slow you down and bring you to a stop. So those are the two times when you should feel heavier because the normal force is either speeding you up or slowing you, speeding you up in the upward direction or slowing you down as you're traveling downward. And then you should feel lighter whenever the normal force is decreased. And so that would be as you're rising up and the elevator begins to slow down. It's basically slowing down out from under you. Uh, your body wants to keep going according to Newton's first law. And so as the elevator slows down, it's gonna have less pushing force on you so that you also slow down. And then the other time would be right when you start to descend. It's kind of like the floor is dropping out from under you. So it provides less normal force so that you can fall. So, and you don't fall free fall, but you do fall, so you descend. So those would be the two times when you'd feel lighter. And then how do these feelings correspond to when it's constant speed versus accelerating? Anytime the speed is constant, whether it's zero or some other value, you would feel your normal weight, the normal force, which we could call your apparent weight, and your true weight would be equal whenever there is a constant speed of zero or any other value. You would feel different than your actual weight whenever there's an acceleration. So it was um, basically completion for this, this part so far. There were really only two parts of this that I graded for accuracy, and they were the two parts, things we had covered a fair bit before Christmas break that I wanted to make sure you still knew. Um, and so this one is the first one that I graded for accuracy. What is the relationship between the direction of net force and acceleration? Well, net forces cause acceleration and so whatever the direction of the net force, that is always the same direction as the acceleration that it causes. And you may remember there was one of the notes sections we had back in December where I even mentioned how the PowerPoint just seemed to be hammering that point home. I think it had like eight or 10 times where it had the phrase, the net force and the acceleration are in the same direction. So this, you may have forgotten it, but this was a, an attempt at, for me to spiral it back to your attention that the net force and the acceleration are always in the same direction. So that was one that I did grade for uh, accuracy. This next question is also one I graded for accuracy because we've done these weight calculations many times. You take the mass times the acceleration due to gravity, and it's okay if you use 9.8 or 10, um, but you do need to remember that Newtons are kilogram meters per second squared, not gram meters per second squared. So you have to convert that 50 grams that was given into kilograms, all right? So to make it a Newton, which is what we measure force in, you have to change grams to kilograms. We reviewed that briefly uh, in class as well. We didn't talk about the math. We talked about the units, what a Newton is. And then the rest of it was, again, now back to, okay, did they complete it? Um, I understand that even with the scale, if you happen to be one of the students that was able to come to class and do this in person, even with the scale, it's a little hard to see what's going on uh, because the scale bounces so much. I, most of you that were here and doing it in person had to do it over and over and over again to try to see what was going on. Um, and if you did it with a rubber band, you would see the same thing, but I think it's even a little bit harder to see because there's not an actual dial or, or a measuring value for you to kind of rate it to or re um, refer to it reference it to. So here is what I was hoping you would experience, but as long as you wrote down what you experienced, it was fine. So when you would, the first part here is when you're, when the elevator's rising upward. So when you first start to accelerate upward, your weight reading, the normal force on the scale would be heavier. The way that would look on the rubber band is the rubber band would stretch more than if it were just at rest. 
And then once you achieve a constant rate, even though you're still rising, the weight reading on the scale should be the same as if it were just at rest. And the rubber band's shape should be the same as if it were just at rest. It'll just take that normal shape. And then when you start to slow down at the top, the reading on the scale should be lighter because the object's inertia wants it to keep going. And the rubber band should actually look more relaxed than the at rest shape. So it should take less of an oblong shape and become more circular, it should be more relaxed looking. So that's what I was hoping you would witness and observe. And then as you're simulating the downward ride, as soon as you start to descend, uh, because there's a downward acceleration, you should see a lighter reading on the scale. And for the rubber band, you should see it relax. And you can actually probably see that pretty well, because as soon as you start to lower, the weight's going to not pull as hard on the rubber band. You should see it kind of relaxed. When the weight was moving at a constant rate, the weight reading, again, which is the normal force, would be the same. And this is where it's often hard to see on the scale. Um, on the rubber band, it actually might be a little easier to see that it sort of takes its normal shape again. And then when you start to slow it down at the bottom, this one I think appears pretty clearly either way, whether you're using the scale or the rubber band. Um, as you start to slow down, the rubber band will start to stretch because the object wants to keep going. And the reading on the scale should go lower, which is a heavier value or a larger value because the object wants to keep descending. So those are the observations I was hoping you would see, but any observations earned you credit because in a lab, the data you collect, as long as it's logical, um, and carries anything that would need to be there. In this case, there's no units or anything. So uh, pretty much anything that you wrote that was semi-logical should be fine because it's an experience I wanted you to have. Then the last question, some of you actually had some conversation with me about this already, uh, but some haven't. The question says, if you're carrying a package, would it feel heavier or lighter at certain times in the elevator ride? And it actually would. Um, it's the floor that provides the normal force on you to make you accelerate, but you provide the normal force on the package. So since you are actually the one accelerating the package, you would feel that heavier and lighter effect on the package because you're providing the normal force, not the elevator. The elevator accelerates you, and in turn, then you have to accelerate the package. If you didn't, the package would fall to the floor. Okay, so you would have to provide that normal force and you would have to accelerate it upward or downward depending on the direction of the ride. All right, any questions about the feelings in an elevator assignment? Okay, we'll put that one to rest then. If you would like to discuss anything with me later during the work time, that's fine. But for now, we'll move on. So let's go to the elevator video analysis and discuss that. Now this one, I did grade more of this for precision because uh, with the assistance of the video and the sounds you can hear in the video and the things you see in the video, you hopefully can start to piece together what's going on. And then especially once you start drawing the free body diagrams, you should be able to understand hopefully, but before you're done, what's happening. That's the goal of this assignment. Um, it's not really a lab, it's actually a reflective assignment to help you analyze video and try to understand what's happening. So number one, describe the times when you would feel your normal weight. You can say it most simply by just saying whenever the elevator is not accelerating. You would feel normal whenever the elevator is not accelerating. Now, you could say at rest or when you're moving at a constant velocity. That would be another way to say it. It means the same thing but probably the simplest is just to say when the elevator is not accelerating. Number two, describe the time in the, the times in the elevator when you would feel heavier than normal. That is any time the elevator is accelerating you upward. Because your weight force is down, any time there's an upward acceleration, regardless of the direction you're moving. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be going up. It's just when the acceleration is up. So anytime the acceleration is upward, you would feel heavier because your weight is always downward. And so because they're opposite, you feel heavier. Um, Number three, describe. Yeah, go ahead. Question. I have a good question. So also, you feel heavier when the elevator is going down um, slowly. Uh, sorry, like 
when it accelerates uh, slowly. Is that true or no? Well, if the accelerator is going down and it's slowing down, you do feel heavier, but the acceleration is not down. If you're slowing down in the downward motion, the acceleration is up. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. Right? Um, if, and we'll see this on the uh, free body diagrams, but if you recall from first semester, when the acceleration and the velocity are opposite each other, that means the object is slowing down. So when the elevator's velocity is down, if you're slowing down, that must mean the acceleration is up because they have to be opposite to be slowing you down. So when the elevator is descending downward, you'll slow down because of an upward force. And the, the acceleration, the direction is going up, that doesn't really necessarily mean um, the acceleration is increasing. It's just the direction is different, right? Correct. Yeah, it doesn't have to be an increasing acceleration. It could be a constant acceleration, but it's just the direction of the acceleration has to be upward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Anything else before we look at number three? All right, number three, uh, you would feel lighter whenever the acceleration is downward. Since your weight is down, if the acceleration is also down, whenever the velocity and the acceleration are the same direction, you'll be speeding up. And whenever those forces are in the same direction, you would feel lighter. And so that can happen whether you're rising or falling, but the acceleration would have to be downward. So when you're at the top and, and just start to descend, that has a downward and acceleration. And then uh, when you are rising and slow down, that also has a downward acceleration. So it doesn't matter which direction you're actually moving. It just matters which direction the acceleration is. So if the acceleration is downward, because that matches the same direction as your weight, you would have a lighter feeling. The normal force would be less. Questions on one, two, or three? All right. So um, when you watch the video, you were supposed to come up with some numbers. And I was very flexible on what numbers you interpreted because it wasn't super clear and it's bumping around a little bit. So you're definitely having to make some estimations. But whenever it was at rest or constant velocity, it was pretty close to 200. You might have said 201, 202, but pretty close to 200. And uh, you may have, I, I did change this from 4.5 to 4.45. I think I changed that before your class, but if you downloaded it before the change, you might have one that says 4.5. And that will also slightly change these values. But uh, so I, I was not too concerned if you had the same number as me, as long as I could tell you did the work correctly. So something close to 200 pounds and something close to 890 Newtons when you convert it. And then the maximum scale, uh, a lot of people had 222. I think I saw it go to 222 multiple times. I just try to use nice round numbers here. So if you had like 218, 220, 222, somewhere in that range, uh, then that was fine. And when you convert roughly 220 pounds to Newtons, you get 980 Newtons. Now the minimum scale was probably the most uh, different from student to student because right at the beginning, it drops to 180 because the elevator was actually descending and the acceleration rates are different for an elevator going up versus going down. So uh, right at the beginning when it was descending, you actually see about a 180 pretty close to 180. Most of the rest of the time, the elevator was rising. And so it was closer to 186, 187, most of those times. So you might've had 180, 185, 186, 187, 188, somewhere in that range. So I was even more flexible on this one, but definitely it should be under 200 pounds, somewhere between 180 and 190. And then if you used 180, that would refer to an 800 Newton force. So here we've got the weight force in pounds, and we also have the weight force in newtons. Pounds is what was measured on the scale, but newtons is what we want to use in our free body diagrams. Any questions about the numbers? I didn't see too many people have trouble with that. All right, then we're thinking, okay, well, how would all of these points in time compare in terms of the scale reading? 
when would the scale reading be equal to, greater than, or less than when it's just actually sitting at rest? So when it's at rest at the bottom, that's basically the baseline. That's obviously equal because that's the point we're referring it to. When it first starts to go up, that's going to be a normal force accelerating you upward. So the normal force is going to be greater. The scale is going to read more. Then once you reach a constant speed in the upward direction, because it's constant, no acceleration means no net force. No net force means they're going to be equal. They balance each other out. So the scale will read the equal value. When it starts to slow down, your body wants to keep going. So the scale is going to read a little bit less. When you stop at the top and you come to rest, you're at rest again, so it's going to be equal. When you start to descend, the floor basically is dropping out from under you. So in that acceleration moment, you're going to feel less or it's going to measure a less value. But once you achieve constant speed in the downward direction, it's going to be equal again. And then uh, once you slow down to a stop, as you're, as you're slowing down to a stop, it's going to measure a larger value because it's pushing against you to slow you down. So uh, those are the equal greater, equal less values for those various times in the ride. And then to convert the numbers to kilograms so that we actually know the mass of the person, um, you would need to either take this 200 pounds and use a converter to figure out what that would be in kilograms. So most of the converters will use 2.2 pounds per kilogram or 0.454 kilograms per pound. Um, or you could take this 890 or whatever your value was and divide it by 9.8 because the force divided by the acceleration gives you the mass. And since this is a weight force, the weight divided by the acceleration due to gravity gives you the mass. Either way, you should get somewhere between 90 and 92. So a lot of you had 91 point something for this. Questions on page one. All right, let's move on to the free body diagram. So the directions to say, one, draw a quantitative free body diagram. So I'm looking that you have quantities on here, numbers, uh, for the passenger. So the dot is the passenger in each of the following situations during the elevator ride. Label the forces in Newtons. So we need to use our correct units. To the right of each diagram, I did it on the left because there was more room the way mine came up. I didn't really care if it was right or left, but somewhere in there, draw a velocity and acceleration vector. And so here I put zero, but over here you can see I used arrows. Um, and then calculate the net force and acceleration of the person. So several steps to accomplish. Let's look at the first two scenarios. Uh, when we have the elevator at rest, there is no velocity. So some of you just put a dot and, and to represent that, which is fine. I just put zero meters per second. Um, and then it's not moving, so there's no acceleration. So zero meters per second squared. Some of you, again, just put a dot as opposed to an arrow. And then the net force would be zero because there's got to have to be an acceleration if there's a, for if there's a net force. And it's not because it's just sitting still. So we know the weight. I, I had 890 on my page. So if I refer back up here, my weight force at rest was 890. Okay, so I used 890 for the weight on all of them. And that should be the same for every free body diagram. Here, here, every one of them. The weight of the person doesn't change. The normal force is the scale measurement. So it looks like our weight is changing, but it's not really our weight. Our weight is just our mass times acceleration due to gravity. And no matter how good a diet you're on, you're not going to lose mass in a short elevator ride. Okay? Um, and gravity is not going to change if that, with that short change in height. So your weight's going to be the same. It should be 890 for all eight of these free body diagrams or whatever you had, something close to that. In this case, though, because there's no net force, the normal force has to be equal to it. So whatever you have here down at the bottom, you need to have the same thing up here at the top. So I wasn't necessarily looking, did you have the same numbers as I did? I was looking to see, did you have equal values there? Number two, when you start to go up, so now it's accelerating you upwards, meaning it's going to have to use, uh, generate a larger normal force. So you should come back up here, look at your maximum reading. That's your, that's your value that means it's pushing you upward, it's accelerating you upward. And so 
I use that for my upward velocity. You can see this arrow is longer. This arrow is still 9, 8, or 890. It's always going to be 890 for the weight. It's going up, so my velocity vector for, uh, for that is upward. My net force is just the difference between these two. So 980 minus 890 is 90 newtons. Now, I had some of you had as low as 60 or 70. Some of you had over 100. Just depends on your interpretation. I just was looking to see that these were different, that the normal force was larger, and that you subtracted them. Once you have the net force here, it is upwards because the upward force is larger than the downward. And when you divide that by the kilogram mass that we calculated, so again, right up here, looking at this, I had it a right, right under 91 for me. So I'm going to divide this 90 newtons by about 91 kilograms. So I get almost one meter per second squared. The net force and the acceleration are always in the same direction. So if the net force is upward, the acceleration has to be upward as well. Now notice the velocity is up, acceleration is up, they're both the same direction, so the person should be speeding up at this point. And they went from rest to going upwards, so they were speeding up in the upward direction. Any questions about one or two? All right, don't focus too much on match, but just whether the pattern is the same. Do you have a question, somebody I heard? Uh, yeah, wait, sorry. Can you go over how you got the acceleration again? Yeah, so I just used Newton's second law, F equals MA. And I know it's the net force equals mass times acceleration. And so if I subtract these two, that's my net force. And then up here, we found the mass. So I just take the net force divided by mass to get the acceleration. Anything else? I didn't see you slip in, Gavin. I don't know how I how I clicked the admit button without noticing. I uh, I I think I was in the Zoom at twelve twenty two. That's when I, I came in. So. Okay. Yeah. I don't. I just didn't remember hitting admit. I must. Maybe I just hit enter on something else and it let you in. <laughs> Glad you're here. All right. Let's move on to three and four. So number three, going up at a constant speed. So we're still going up, our velocity vector is upward, but constant speed means zero acceleration. Zero acceleration means zero net force. Zero net force means this and this have to be equal. And the weight has to always be the same. So whatever I had in one and two, it needs to be the same here. And the normal force has to be equal to it to balance it out. For number four, as the elevator starts to slow down, approaching the top, my body wants to keep going. So the floor doesn't have to push me as hard. It actually wants to push me less, so I slow down. So the normal force must be less than this weight. Again, the weight stays constant the whole time, so this has to be less. Now I'm looking back up here and saying, well, what was my minimum reading? Well, my minimum was 800. So that's what it's going to be whenever I'm slowing down in the upward direction. So I'm still moving up, even though I'm slowing down, my velocity is still in the upward direction. Therefore, my acceleration must be down. In order for it to be slowing, these two arrows have to be in the opposite direction. The velocity and the acceleration have to be opposite for me to be slowing down. And then I find the acceleration's value the same way. I, I subtract these. I see that my net force is 90 newtons in the downward direction. Divide it by the mass from page one and I get roughly negative one meters per second squared. Um, one quick question. Why did you use uh, normal force, eight, uh, 800 Newton normal force? Because that's your minimum when it's going down, right? Uh, well, the minimum would be either going down or going up. So if, I, if the elevator is taking force. me upwards, yeah, if the elevator is taking me upward, and it starts to slow down, my body wants to keep going upward. Yeah. Right? I, so I the scale is going to be less than normal at that point. Mm -hmm. But it will be the same force as it's going down, that the exact same force, 800? No, your weight will actually be 890. Your weight won't change because weight is your mass times the acceleration due to gravity. 
So you feel lighter because the floor is pushing against you less. Yeah, yeah I, I understand that, but I just don't understand. I, I thought you'll be a different number than 800, like something like 820 or something. Because 800 is the exact force when is when the elevator is accelerating downwards, right? Well, it, yeah, if you're at the beginning, it doesn't say it's accelerating downward. I'm actually just making that assumption. Um, and oh. if, the ele if the elevator was accelerating the same value both up and down, which I could assume it's not based on what I see, but I don't really know that. So once I found my minimum, I just used that for every normal force that was lower. Now, if you changed it and you said, well, you, if you made the assumption I did and you said, well, I'm going to use 800 when it's going down and I'm going to use 820 or whatever it is when it's going up and slowing down, that's fine. As long as your normal force is less than your weight force. Okay. Yeah. yeah that was my question. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, sure. So if you got to that level of detail where you were really paying that close of attention, that's fine. I wasn't necessarily seeing, do you have the same numbers as me? I was looking to see, is your normal force less than your weight force here? Makes sense. Okay. Anything else on these? All right, so once you have these four done, you can literally copy and paste them on the next page, but just in a slightly different order, and then just make very small changes. Uh, some of them, you don't have to make any changes. So like for number five, you're sitting stopped at the top. This is exactly like number one. No velocity, no acceleration, no net force. Your weight going down is equal to, but opposite from the normal force going up. So this number five should look identical to number one in every way. Number six, starting to go down. So in this case, the floor is dropping out from under you. So that normal force is going to be less than your weight so that you start to descend. If it wasn't less, you wouldn't descend. So it has to be less so that you start to fall. You just fall in a controlled manner. So you're going to start to fall, which means your velocity is downward and you are accelerating downward. We can see if we look at these two forces, the greater force is in the downward direction. Your weight is more than the normal force. So if your net force is down, the acceleration has to be down. The direction of the net force and the acceleration are always equal and in the same direction. There, I guess the values aren't equal, but their direction is always the same. So in this case, we've got a velocity down and an acceleration down. So this means we are speeding up in the downward direction because these are both in the same direction. So we're going from rest to something that's not rest, right? We're speeding up from zero to some negative value in our velocity. Questions on five or six? All right, number seven is almost exactly like number three. Uh, the only difference is this velocity arrow has to be pointing down. Everything else is the same, constant speed, means no acceleration. No acceleration means no net force. No net force means the weight and the normal force have to be equal. But this time we're going down, so the velocity arrow for V points downward. Number eight, slowing down to a stop. So now the floor is gonna have to push against me to make me slow down. My body doesn't want to naturally slow down. My body wants to keep going. So it has to push against me to slow me down. My weight doesn't change, it's still 890. So the floor has to be something bigger than 890 in order to slow me down. And so I used my maximum value 980. And then I subtract these two to find the net force. I divide by mass to find the acceleration. And I know that the net force is upward because the vector on top is bigger. If the net force is upward, the acceleration has to be upward. And because I'm still descending, right? I'm, I'm slowing down, but I'm still going downward. My velocity is down, but my acceleration is up. When they are opposite, that is logical that I should be slowing down. Okay. Questions on video analysis activity. All right, if you want to ask me some specific questions related to your, your specific paper, that's fine. 
we can do that during the work time here in just a few minutes. Uh, but for now, let's go back to the agenda briefly. Um, so we've reviewed that. The assignment today is going to be determining a spring constant gizmo. Um, so if we had been able to stay on campus, you'd be doing the spring constant lab. And so before I actually show you the gizmo, I'm going to take about five minutes and show you some equipment that goes along with what you brainstormed as your lab procedure. So I'm going to stop sharing this. I'm going to pin this video. So hopefully you can see over here on the side of the classroom, the main reason I'm teaching from the class today, uh, I wanted to show you if we were doing this in person, this is the equipment you could have. This is the three procedures that you guys came up with that you could use. So I've got a, a tiny little spring here, a little bit bigger spring and an even bigger spring. They're all connected to a ring stand like you would use in chemistry class. I've clamped it to the table so it won't tip over. Um, and I have all these little weights here. So these are bigger than the ones that we used in the other demo. These are 500 instead of 50. You can see that see they still have this hook on the top and then underneath it's probably hard to see on the camera but if i can get it turned just right you can maybe see there's a bar underneath there it's hard to do <laughs> uh, but you can actually nest them together so i'm going to put 500 grams on this spring and i would just use a meter stick and measure okay i know how long the spring is at rest how long is it with 500 grams hanging from it and so I would just hang that on there, use a meter stick, and see how much it changed. And then I can do the same thing for this one. And you can see when I let go, this one barely moves. So this is a much more rigid spring with a much higher spring constant. And then this one moves a little bit more, actually. And so this one is actually it's a bigger looking spring, but it's actually not quite as firm as this middle one. Now, that would be one measurement. And then I could hang this one on the bottom and make it stretch more. And then I can hang this one on the bottom of that and make it stretch more. And it's just gonna keep stretching it and stretching it. I know the mass of each of these, they're each 500 grams. So right now I have two kilograms hanging on this spring. And I just take two kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. And that's the weight hanging on the spring. That would be the weight force on the Y axis. And I would use the ruler to measure how much this spring stretched every time I added weight. And that would be my displacements on the X axis. And then I graph them and the slope tells me the spring constant for this spring. I can do the same thing for this one. I add weight, measure its new length. I add weight, measure its new length. I add weight, measure its new length. And you can see that this one isn't stretching as much as the other one. And so it must have a higher spring constant. And I would just keep going until I satisfied the eight by 10 rule. And that was one of the procedures some of you group, your groups came up with, just adding weight to the spring and measuring how much the spring's length changed when you did that. All right, so that is one way to do this experiment. Now, the second way that you talked about in class was instead of using these weights, some of you suggested using a spring scale. So I also have a spring scale here. The spring scale is much stronger, much more rigid than the one that we used in the other hands-on activity. And it also has newtons on this side and grams on this side. So we can actually measure the newtons on this scale. You probably can't see it on the camera, but um, and it goes all the way to 20 newtons. So it can go to a pretty high value. So I could do the same kind of an idea. I can hook this spring scale onto the spring, measure the relaxed length of the spring, and then I can pull on the scale to stretch the spring and read how much force I'm applying on the scale. And then I pull more, make a new measurement, read my new force. Pull more, make a new measurement, read my new force. And I can just keep gathering data with that procedure, which is what some of you suggested. The last one that I have is the digital scale or the digital force meter. So I've got two versions of it. This is the one I'm gonna use. It's got a little hook on the top and it connects to the TI Inspire with this cable attachment. Now I also have this one. It's the same kind of force meter, but this one has a stopper on top. So you can actually, this kind with the hook, 
when you pull the hook, it measures a force. This one with the stopper, when you push the stopper, it measures the force. It's a dual action sensor. So it can actually measure pushes or pulls. Now I want it to measure a pull. So I'm going to plug this into the TI Inspire, but first, uh, let me go ahead and hang it on here first. So I'm going to hang the sensor on the spring and I would measure the length of the spring. And then I'm going to change it from this view and use, uh, I want to show you the calculator view. All right, so I am going to, there we go. Can you guys see the um, cast screen or do I need to change the share? We can see it. Okay, so you can see cast at the top, scratch pad, calculate graph. Um, Let me just do, I think I might be showing you the wrong one here. Is it a black screen, cast, scratch pad, calculate, graph? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we can see it now. Oh, yes. yeah, now it is. Okay, so I actually have it wirelessly connected to my computer. And so what you're seeing is actually the screen on this handheld. And when I plug in this sensor, it's going to automatically pick up, oh, there's a force sensor attached, right? And it actually starts measuring the force sensor. Now, I want to calibrate this because Right now it's not reading zero, but I want it to. So I can do menu, experiment, calibrate. And then I want to, this is a dual range four sensor and I want to do a single point calibration. I just want to tell it this point right here is zero. I want this to be my zero reference. And then I hit keep and I hit okay. And it should get close to zero now. It's swinging a little bit, so there's going to be a little bit of motion there. And then I use my meter stick to measure the length, and I pull it to a certain force. And then I pull it to another force. And then I pull it to another force. And I pull it to another force. And I just keep changing the force and measuring the new length of the spring, and then I would be calculating it, or sorry, measuring it digitally. So those are the main kinds of equipment you could use for this lab if we were doing it in person. I just want you to start to visualize what we hope to do eventually together. Any questions about any of that? All right, let me just make sure you understand how to do the um, gizmo assignment then. So if you go to the bulletin board page of our class, you guys seeing access now? Okay, uh, over here on the links, there's the link to Zoom, there's the link to positive physics, and then right below that, the gizmo login. So that's where you're gonna wanna go, gizmo login. When you go to the Explore Learning website, which is affectionately called Gizmos, Gizmo is the name of their simulations, you'll need to log in. Your username should be last name followed by first name, same as um, positive physics. So I'm just going to log into my teacher account. Your view will look slightly different. I don't know your passwords, but I can look them up if you forget them. So you guys are section three. Uh, you should see a list of gizmos in our class, and you want this first one determining a spring constant. Um, if you need me to look up your password, I can. I won't show it on the screen here, but just as a reminder, like Haley's username would be Barney Haley, and then Derrickson, Atticus, Han, Frank. So it's just your last name, first name. And then if you need me to look up your password, I can do that when it's not on the screen so we don't show everybody. When you open up the Determining Spring Constant page, yours again will look a little bit different but you should see an interactive screen. You should see um, links to some documents. So my links are just right here on this page. I think on the student version, you have to like hover over the title where it says determining a spring constant. And then you should see this student exploration sheet. 
and you should find it in PDF form, Word form, Google Doc. You can pick whichever form you want. And that's what you're going to turn in. Uh, this is what it looks like. So you know you found the right thing. This is the PDF form of it. Student exploration determining a spring constant. Some of these questions you'll answer. And because it says it's like a prediction, if you do it, you get full credit. Some of them are actual measurements and calculations, and those will be uh, graded for precision. Okay, so I want to see if you're getting accurate values. But if it's a prediction, you may not know what it's going to be. Predictions are hypotheses, so those are going to be graded for completion. On the actual screen, so you should see a, a picture here, and it should say launch gizmo if you hover over it. Once you launch it, you've got this screen where you've got your ruler, you've got your spring, you've got a bunch of weights. Over here, it gives you a description, and then there's a tab for the table for your data, and then there's a tab for the graph, all the things we would be doing in person if we could do it in person. So I'm going to just right now click record data, and it shows me I have zero mass on the spring, so zero force hanging in weight. Its position, the bottom of the spring is at five centimeters. It is not stretched at all. Then I'm going to put the pan on. I need to wait until it quits bouncing around a little bit, and then I'm going to hit record data. Well, down here at the bottom, it says the scale is 20 grams, and here on my table, it confirms that 20 gram mass, which is a 0.2 Newton weight. It's stretched now to 5.65 length, which means it's got a 0.65 centimeter stretch by putting the pan on. Then I can add these other things, let it bounce around a little bit, record the data. Now I've got three data points. And you're just going to follow the directions in the PDF document or Word document and do what it says, answer the questions, fill in the data, collect the data, look at the graph. You can see as I put the data points in the table, it's also putting them on my graph. If you click show line, it just puts a random line on here and you need to use this scale here to try to line it up to get your best fit. Okay, so that's how you're going to operate this gizmo. Um, then when you're ready to change the scale, you can do clear data or change the spring. You can do clear data, take the weight off, take the pan off and choose another spring because in the gizmo, it asks you to do a couple of different springs and find the spring constant for each one, just like we would be doing in class. All right. Any questions about how to do the gizmo, what to turn in? You're going to turn it in on axis. You will see on the student version some assessment questions or evaluation questions. Those are just for you to practice if you want. You don't need to turn those in. All you need to turn in is this document. Questions? When is this due? Monday night. Okay, cool. Anything else? All right, you've got about a half an hour, so uh, you can stay on the Zoom if you would like and ask questions about anything, elevators, this lab, the worksheet that's due tonight, um, or if you don't have any questions, you just want to work, you can log off Zoom and go to work. Um, if you are going to be leaving, then uh, I'll say my goodbyes now. I hope you have a great rest of your week and a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you on Monday. Um, but if you have any kinds of questions or just want to interact about anything else, uh, feel free to stick around. I'll keep the Zoom running till 1.40. Uh, that way, if anyone needs help, you can even come and go if you need to. So I will stop the recording.